Good morning, um, it's Leslie Veronica and today I want to talk about the Home Rule Crisis. So Asquith introduced the um, Third Home Rule Bill in 1912. Um, this bill to many Irish nationalists was quite disappointing because so many powers were retained at Westminster. It didn't go as far as many in the Home Rule Party would have liked it to have seen. Um, so it was a very limited form of devolution. And in many respects, this reflects the view of the Liberal Party introducing this third Home Rule Bill as opposed to Gladstone's previous Home Rule Bills, where Gladstone had more enthusiasm about Home Rule. In fact, Asquith did not have. Uh, and that might play a part later on when we're thinking about to what extent did Asquith and the Liberal Party uh, mishandle the whole Home Rule crisis. Foreign affairs was dominant at this time. Um, in terms of you know the run up to the First World War, um, the First World War had been on the cards from 1908. It wasn't um, set in stone in 1912. I mean, it could easily have been averted. It had been averted on at least two separate occasions prior to that. However, there's no doubt that the rise of Germany as a major European and therefore world power uh, was something that was already causing concern. Equally, internal affairs were very important for this Liberal Party. We know already from what we have seen that there had been an ongoing battle between the Commons and the Lords that had been resolved to a certain extent by the Parliament Act. But aside from that, this is a Liberal government that is very focused on social reform and therefore more concerned with domestic policy and really not wanting to be distracted by the Irish question. Um, other issues and I have mentioned this briefly before, is the rise in suffragette activity and the whole movement for votes for women, and also the rise in trade unionism. So there are other issues going on that the Liberals are more concerned about, but they do have a deal with Redmond and the Home Rule Party. The first part of that deal was delivered, and the first part of that deal did include curtailing the powers of the House of Lords, and the second part was to bring in a Home Rule Bill. The Conservatives, on the other hand, are passionately against Home Rule. So whereas the Liberals are not passionately for it, the Conservatives have the advantage of being passionately against Home Rule. Some of this is political expediency, although we can overdo that as well. You know, so for someone in the Conservative Party, this is a way of reuniting the Conservatives and of defeating the Liberals and hopefully getting back into power. However, others did believe very firmly that it would damage the Empire. Uh, and most British Conservatives would put as their number one reason for opposing Home Rule the potential damage to the Empire. And they did believe that the bargain that Asquith had struck with the Irish Nationalists with the Home Rule Party was wrong. Uh, and it will be referred to later on as the nefarious or corrupt bargain. And that language is used throughout the um, campaign against Home Rule. The scale of Conservative opposition to Home Rule was really quite astounding and this becomes much more marked after Andrew Bonner Law takes over as leader of the Conservative Party. Bonner Law had a personal connection to Ulster and unlike other aristocratic Tory leaders, he respected and could work with, with enthusiasm, um, working class and middle class unionists alike. Whereas other aristocratic Tory leaders were always deeply suspicious um, of middle class and working class unionists, this was not a barrier for Andrew Bonner Law. Carson had taken over as unionist leader in 1910, and although technically a southern unionist, um, he from the start could see the potential in harnessing uh, the great force that existed within Ulster with his cross class unionist base an ally in that with a strong conservative ally in the form of Bonner Law to really launch a, a massive campaign against this Home Rule Bill. Politically, um, the debates in the Lords and the Commons are one place in which that campaign will take place. However, it was pretty obvious from the very start that that may not be the main seat of this campaign. In other words, because of the Parliament Act, because of the size of the Liberal a majority with the help of the Home Rule Party, it was unlikely that a Home Rule Bill was going to be defeated politically, parliamentary, in the Commons and in the Lords. And it was very likely the Lords would stand against it, but equally so, under the new Parliament Act, 
as long as that bill went through in identical form through the Commons three times, then it could become law in two years' time. And that was known. So uh, there needed to be a campaign that was extra parliamentary. And I think that's something that we'll come back to both in this uh, mini lecture and also in the next one, which will look at the Ulster resistance campaign and the unionist campaign against Home Rule more specifically. The Conservatives also, from the very start, tried to involve the King. This is a new King. He was an inexperienced King. And they were very keen. And at numerous points um, along the way, we see them asking the King to intervene. Now, the King, what they wanted the King to do, if you like, was to sack the government. Um, but the King was unlikely to do that. This has been done in the past, and it always came back negatively on the monarchy. And the king didn't fall for that. However, again, numerous points along the way, the king did intervene and make petition to ask with request uh, special measures, request that there are additional meetings. So the king is involved in this um, at the behest of the Conservative Party. So that's one strand that the Conservatives uh, go for. And, and the king also uses influence to try to undermine home rule to a certain extent. Uh, like Carson, the Conservatives saw Ulster as the potential way to block Home Rule. Um, in Ulster, there was a Catholic majority in five out of the nine counties, if you think of the province of Ulster. Nonetheless, there was this uh, understanding that Ulster Unionists would be very prepared to fight Home Rule uh, and to fight it in whatever way necessary. This had been demonstrated in their opposition to both the previous Home Rule bills. Um, and obviously, when we get into looking at Ulster resistance, We'll look at this in more detail, but the setting up of the UVF really embodies this. Serious plans for civil war were laid. There were plans to evacuate the women and children to Scotland. There were plans for a provisional government. In fact, you know, a provisional government was uh, established. And again, we'll pick that up in the next lecture. And links were established with Germany to procure arms. Now, Ask with strategy has come in for um, a lot of criticism and one of the things we have to understand about Ask with strategy is that for him the important thing was getting the Home Rule Bill through Parliament for three successive sessions in identical form. There's very little doubt that he knew that he would have to make concessions, that concessions would have to come. But his hope was that those concessions could come after that. You know, that he would get this bill through, that then he could make concessions because then unionists would be, if you like, on the ropes and would be forced to negotiate. So Asquith's policy was to negotiate after the bill had passed through the House of Commons three times, by which time he hoped unionists would be ready to negotiate or to compromise. Now, the historian Patricia Jalland says this as a very mistaken approach. She's not on her own with regards to this and argues that Asquith should have offered concessions uh, really early on. By 1914, rather than unionism being in a weak position, in fact, it was the government that was in a weak position. So this was a strategy that could have been uh, a marvellous strategy, but events overtook Asquith and uh, his government. Partition had originally been suggested, of course, by a backbench a Liberal MP in June 1912 by Agar Roberts. And it was only reluctantly supported by Carson at that stage. I mean, Carson isn't a partitionist, he's a Southern Unionist. His whole emphasis on Ulster Unionism was really to try to defeat um, Home Rule for all of Ireland. But he did support it. Now, Agar Roberts, I think we should say, when he he suggested a partition um, very, very early on um, in June 1912. He was talking about partition for four counties. All right? He was not talking about the ancient province of Ulster of nine counties, or indeed when I ended up after the 1920 government found like the sixth county um, sort of partition. Increasingly, over the period between 1912 to 1914, the debate moves from a debate about the value of home rule or no home rule to a debate about the area to be excluded from home rule. So that tells us that already the agenda is being set to a certain extent uh, by the unionist at the scale of unionist opposition. 
the government is slowly began to realise um, the severity and seriousness of unionist opposition. And I think that they realised this much more quickly than Redmond and the Home Rule Party. Um, the Home Rule Party continue to see this as bluff. You know, they continue to see it as something that unionists would not resort to some of these more extreme tactics that they kept talking about. They saw it as rhetoric. Um, however, I think that for the government, there certainly is evidence that from December 1912, uh, which is the first time a Carson starts to suggest a nine-county excluded area, Asquith, while publicly inflexible and still backing up Redmond 100%, privately was prepared to offer concessions. As 1914 progressed, both the Conservatives and Liberals are mindful of an upcoming election in 1915 and both begin to moderate their positions a little bit. Now again a lot of this is private and not public um, but neither of them wanted to look like extremists. Um, both felt like a British general election would uh, work in the favour of those who had offered concessions to try to solve this Irish question rather than those who were bel being too belligerent. So there was a desire to placate British public opinion and in March of 1914, this resulted in Asquith formally proposing a modification to the Home Rule Bill, uh, which would allow what was called the county option, the county option, um, which he had very successfully got Redmond to agree to uh, just prior to this. Of course, later on, we would say that this is the beginning of the end for Redmond. Um, hindsight being a wonderful thing, we can say that now. At the time, that wouldn't have been evident. But really, it's the start of Redmond accepting some sort of partition and will come back uh, and work against him eventually. Carson contentiously rejects this. I mean, this was seen as the ace card by Asquith and the Liberals. And when it's presented in Parliament, Carson rejects it. Uh, makes his very famous, you know, we will not accept the stay of execution speech and then storms out of Parliament. Um, and the government after this really does see the potential for civil war erupting. And, and in fact, there's a real fear that Carson has left, is going back to Ulster and is going to start rousing the troops, if you like, for a possible rebellion. It was this move uh, that set in motion what was to eventually give rise to the so-called current mutiny or current incident. And this incident itself is an, an interesting uh, aspect of everything else that went on. I mean, it has been regarded as either uh, an act of great incompetence or a series of incompetencies by a number of key figures, both within the army and within the cabinet, or as a conspiracy. Um, but either way, um, I think that it reveals something very important and a key weakness for the government um, in that if they plan to use the army in Ulster, it's looking increasingly unlikely that they can really guarantee that the army will come out and support them. So the Conservatives in the aftermath of Carson's rejection of the county option really start to prepare to use the army. One of the ways they want to do this is to use the army to uh, bolster arms depots in, in Ireland. The easiest way for any armed group to get arms in Ireland was to you know, attack arms depots that were held uh, by either the R RIC or by um, the army themselves. So that was the first thing. Um, on the back of this, the Conservatives then also adopted a very high risk strategy which was to alter the Army Annual Act and the Army Annual Act goes ahead, it goes through every year, it's really Parliament given approval for the budget for the Army for that year but the Conservatives uh, decide that they will put into this Army Annual Act an amendment to stop the Army being used in Ulster. This is a really radical strategy. Um, unheard of and particularly when we think now that you know to start messing about with the army on the act at a time whenever the world was heading to war again of course at that time that wouldn't have been completely evident but it was really unheard of for um, an opposition party to take this radical action so a series of events take place which ultimately um, end up with I think General Goff and, and Seeley acting well beyond their powers 
and not conveying messages properly and adding bits to messages that haven't been there. And, and certainly, you know, if you have a look at the Cura uh, incident um, in your textbook, in your notes or, you know, elsewhere, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But as I say, ultimately what it reveals is that the army is not secure. The government doesn't have complete control of uh, being able to use the army in Ulster. Now, that is a game changer in terms of the position of the government. It's very undermining for the government. It's very undermining for democracy in many respects. But it also uh, really starts to change the tone of the home rule crisis at this very, very critical time. In May of 1914, the Home Rule Bill officially passed its third reading in the House of Commons um, and therefore it's finally passed and it's due to be signed into royal assent by the King um, and the monarch refused. And this is unusual as well um, in, you know, Britain has a constitutional monarchy. It is accepted that a piece of legislation that has gone through must be signed by the monarch. But the monarch refused, now it refused on very solid grounds. The monarch's argument was that Asquith had said that this could result in civil war and therefore um, it would be remiss of the monarch to sign into law a piece of legislation that could then give rise to civil war uh, in the part of the sovereign nation. So the king then says, look, we need to have a last ditch attempt to get a compromise. I want a compromise before I sign this piece of legislation. And that gave rise to the Buckingham uh, Palace Conference, which of course didn't work. Um, Asquith was preparing his last compromise when news came through uh, that the situation in Europe was dire. And in fact, war was now imminent. So the Irish question had to be postponed. Ironically, Asquith at the time, along with everybody else, thinking that war in Europe would be quick, sharp, over by Christmas, actually, you know, commented that he thought this would be a welcome distraction from the Irish question. Um, in September of 1914, Home Rule was passed. It did have uh, amending legislation attached to it. Uh, that it wouldn't come into effect until the end of the war, which as I say, everybody thought would be quite soon. And it did also have uh, a provision that there would have to be a special amending legislation to make special provision for Ulster, and that would have to be looked at at the end of the war too. In the next video, I'm going to specifically look at uh, Ulster resistance, but what I want to, to sort of think about towards the end of this is what are the key issues uh, with regards to the home rule crisis. It's very important not to lose sight of what happens politically um, and to think about the different talks that happened, the, the talks uh, that took place um, between Carson and Bonner Law, the talks that took place between Bonner Law and Asquith, the Buckingham Palace Conference, the arguments that took place uh, around the debates in the House of Commons. So there is this focus on the parliamentary activity. And again, with regards to Redmond and the Home Rule Party, there's a feeling that sometimes uh, they have too much faith uh, in the ability of the British democratic system to deliver this piece of legislation, that it only mattered. Parliamentary majorities were the only thing. But as we will see, uh, whenever we look at Ulster resistance, and indeed, as Bonner Law said at the Blenheim Palace speech, there are things which are bigger than parliamentary majorities. Thank you.